Arguably, the biggest ethical issue in science is that drug companies withhold unflattering results. So in the end, what we're presented with is a distortion of the data. The Clinical Trial Service Unit is run by Professor Sir Rory Collins. Professor Collins has been heavily critical of anyone who questions the benefits of statins. He's also tried to use his influence to have scientific papers that are critical of his research removed from the British Medical Journal. Is we need to uh, accept that the pharmaceutical industry are there to make profit. They're profit-making businesses. They don't have a legal or fiduciary obligation to give you the best treatment. But the real scandal is that doctors, academic institutions, and medical journals collude with industry for financial gain. And when you look specifically at the guidance coming from NICE over the years on cholesterol, they take their advice from a unit in Oxford University called the Clinical Trial Service Unit. Now, this is not to say that individual academics in those institutions are deliberately misleading people, but there's a huge conflict of interest because this particular unit, which is one of the most influential units in the world when it comes to cholesterol treatment, um, is also one of the ones that receives the most money from the drug industry, hundreds of millions from pharmaceutical uh, industry. Yeah. So, so this needs to be made up front, so there's a big bias there. And when what happens downstream is that doctors are then making clinical decisions on biased and commercially influenced information. So we've got our healthcare system now, which is financed and eminence-based, not ethical, evidence-based medical practice. So this is the point we're making with this now. But there's been a cloud of secrecy around the clinical trials on statins. Most people are, are not aware that the raw data on statin side effects have never been released to the public. It's controlled by one group of researchers led by Professor Rory Collins, um, the, uh, under the CTT collaboration, which is under the CTSU at Oxford University. So they hold all the raw data on the statin side effects. Now, this is an incredibly influential group of scientists. They periodically publish meta-analyses that advocate the wider use of statins. This is the group that um, were pr promoting that everybody over the age of 50, even if they had normal cholesterol, should be on statin medications. Now, they claim to be an independent organisation, but we know from internal documents that were revealed to the British Medical Journal that CTSU has received over £250 £60 million pounds from the makers of cholesterol-lowering medications. Now, the reason they obtain this data and, um, is because they've signed a legally binding agreement with the principal investigators of the clinical trials, which are the drug companies, and they've agreed to withhold the raw data from any third party, and they will not permit independent researchers to verify these results. So this is an egregious lack of transparency in science. Sharing data with other researchers is vital for scientific transparency because it allows for independent scientists to scrutinise the clinical trial results and then it fosters a greater confidence about the true benefits and risks of a medication. Now, this is not just for the public who are taking these medications. This is for the doctors who want to relay balanced information to their patients when they prescribe these medications. They want to tell patients about the harms and the benefits of these medications so that patients are able to make informed choices about which pills they want to take. So it's not surprising that all of the secrecy around the side effects of statins uh, has uh, raised concerns about the authenticity of the statin data. The problem is that the clinical trials are not designed to pick up all the side effects. The CTT collaboration, for example, use mostly drug company data and report very low levels of muscle side effects from statins. But when you look at the side effects in the general population, it's a hundred times higher. There are a lot of ways that one can manipulate data in a trial. Trials do what they call a washout period. And what that means is before they choose the people that are going to be in the trial, they give everybody the drug. And the people that have side effects get excluded from the trial. And they say that so people aren't uncomfortable when they're in the trial. But of course, it takes out all the people that have side effects, and that's very commonly done in drug trials. So the side effects would be grossly underestimated? 
Yes, it would definitely grossly underestimate the number of people that have side effects. They're not as safe as they've made out to be, no. Another way that uh, you can influence public opinion and doctors' opinions about the efficacy of um, uh, statin medications is to design a trial to minimise the harms. And this is essentially what happened in the heart protection study. They design a trial with what they call a run-in period. So they gather, say, um, you know, thousands of participants and they put all the participants on the drug for a period of uh, four to six weeks. Then at the end of this uh, run-in period, there's a high dropout rate. People stop taking the medication, they don't tolerate it, mostly due to side effects. In the heart protection study, 36% of the participants dropped out in this first phase of the trial. So with this freshly culled population of participants, that's when they begin the clinical trial and they separate them between placebo and statin. So at the end, the side effect rates between the statin group and the placebo group are fairly similar. So we know that cutting out all of those people that had side effects from the medication before the trial began grossly underestimates the percentage of people that will experience side effects at the end of the trial. And this is probably why we see that the side effect rate in the statin trials is wildly different to the rates that we see in real world populations. So when you ask doctors what the uh, complication and uh, side effect rates are of statins, they usually say around 20 to 30% of their patients feel muscle pain and um, brain fog. Okay, the experts say statins cause minimal side effects. So Rory Collins, who heads the CTSU, he said that statins are very well tolerated and that uh, side effects are only, uh, or muscle weakness, only occurs one in 10,000 people. So that's pretty rare, one in 10,000 people. And that's what he's said publicly and has maintained this for years in the media. But then an investigation by the Times UK revealed that Professor Collins actually co-invented a diagnostic test for statin intolerance. And the marketing says muscle pains from statins are up to 29%. That's a far cry from one in 10,000 people. This exponential rise in the prescribing of statins has caused a very large chasm between two parts of the medical profession. The proponents say that statins are incredibly life-saving, that they're one of the most important advances in medical history and have prevented untold heart attacks and strokes. But the other side of the spectrum has become more sceptic, um, sceptical, and they say that statins are largely unnecessary and serve no purpose in lowering cholesterol to prevent cardiac problems. So who's right? And, and why is it that we've got this bitter divide amongst uh, a group of uh, educated doctors who are all looking at the same literature. Well, my proposition today is that we need to follow the money. Uh, and that's usually a proposition when you're dealing with industries of this size. One of the ways in which drug companies can effectively influence public opinion, and it's a powerful way, is to silence dissenters. Uh, one of the ways to do this is scientific publications. Uh, in 2016, there was a 30-page review um, authored by Professor Rory Collins, again, um, in a very high-profile journal called The Lancet. Um, it claimed to end the statin debate once and for all. Um, statins were safe and not to listen to any media hype uh, because these uh, medications are wonderful, even for people at low risk of heart disease. So this received widespread media attention and uh, most of the, um, the news coverage in the UK, the US, and, and uh, Australia even, uh, widely publicised this view. Another way to silence dissenters is to discredit them. Now, Professor Rory Collins in a UK uh, uh, outlet said that those who question statin side effects are far worse and have probably killed more people than the paper on the MMR vaccine. So again, accusing you of murdering people is an effective way at trying to discredit you. So what happens when you stop statins? Well, 
in France, there was actually a sort of natural experiment where this happened. So there was a, uh, a controversy in 2012, 2013. There was some big controversy. The discontinuations increased by 50%. And so everybody's like, oh, people are going to die. People are going to die. And it's like, what happened? What didn't happen was they didn't die. So if you look at mortality, 558 in 2012 and 556 in 2013. Cardiovascular deaths, 32.2 in 2012, 31.6 in 2013. So it's like, here's all these big you know, uh, people who are raising all this ruckus. Oh, if you s talk about statins, people are going to die. People are going to get a heart attack. They don't die. They don't get heart attacks. You're just trying to give it to the right people. And this is the problem, is that there are a population of people who take these drugs who should. But that's a relatively small amount. Then it's like, oh, but you don't make money by selling a small amount of drug. You make money by selling a large amount of drug. So you want to push it out into the general population so that everybody over 50 is taking this stuff. But it's not that useful. And this is what it showed. Uh, Professor Steve Nissen from the Cleveland Clinic also said that we need to push back on people challenging statins. Um, and he, uh, he said that there was a rise in the internet cult. So calling you a cult leader or a cult follower is an effective way to discredit you. This guy, Steve Nissen, for example, he says, well, you know, if you're against statins, you're like an anti-vaxxer. That's, that's what he says, right? And it's like, well, he's also the guy who's taking all the money from Amgen and Pfizer and everything, right? So it's not an unbiased opinion. And then you get like crazy, crazy stuff, um, you know, like talking about the statins that, oh, everybody should be getting it. They should be putting it in the drinking water. Everybody over the age of 50 should be getting it. It's like, where are these opinions coming from? Because if you look at the actual science, which Malcolm does, it's not there. There's nothing to support that sort of use to put these drugs into you know, the mouths of millions of patients. The influence of the pharmaceutical companies is everywhere. They have their tentacles everywhere. And they try to, I'm sorry for this expression, but that's true. They try to bribe every type of person they can. And there are examples that they have bribed every type of person there is, including ministers of health. So. The money is everywhere. The drug industry systematically buys doctors. They buy their loyalty by putting thousands of them on their advisory boards or as consultants or they lecture for drug companies, which is also bad because uh, education of doctors should have nothing to do with drug companies. And in this way, they buy loyalty among doctors. Pharmaceutical companies can increase the market size for a medication by investing in the education of doctors and the general public. So by the time a physician is in practice, he's been taught, very dogmatically by the way, that cholesterol is a villain, that cholesterol and saturated fats cause atherosclerosis. And when they get done with their training and they're out there in practice, they don't change those belief systems very easily. You have a bunch of corrupted journals, you have a bunch of corrupted physicians and researchers, and then the, the guy at the end of the line, the medical student, is coming in and being taught that how they should take all this evidence-based medicine, make sure everything is evidence-based, 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 but the base upon which you base it is, is, is corrupted. So this is the way it works, right? And unfortunately, this is true. So you have pharmaceutical companies, who gives through glyphs, flattery and stuff. They target the doctors, the universities, the professors, because they're giving them sort of like 10 times or 15 times more than the individual doctors, which develop a favorable bias towards this drug of choice, which means more drugs are prescribed, which means more money for the pharmaceuticals, from which they can then pay the doctors again. And you see, this is the problem, is that people are catching on. In its effect, it's certainly scientific fraud, and it 
in its effect, it's organized crime. Um, it's always difficult to allege intent, but it is clear that manipulation of evidence subjects many people to treatments that those people should never have been subjected to. I think there is criminal activity that goes on. There is a sense that science is science, so it doesn't matter who pays for it. And yet, because the research is privatized, the fundamental purpose for which it's conducted has changed. It's not to improve the public's health, it's to fulfill the fiduciary obligations of the sponsors and create an opportunity to maximize profits instead of improve the public's health. Some might say that that's a rather cynical view of how science works. To say it's cynical that commercial sponsorship of science taints the science is just totally naive. It's, it's silly. Business is in business. Their job is to make money. We ought to be clear in our public discourse that to say we've got a bias in commercially sponsored research is neither cynical nor paranoid nor impolite. It's a fact. So let's just accept it as a fact and stop being naive at our own expense. Until the science of clinical trials can break free from commercial interest, then decisions about our health rest in the hands of big business. The views expressed in this episode of Catalyst are not intended as medical advice. Please consult with your doctor regarding your medications.